Welcome back for another tutorial video. This one's going to look at guiding. Um, with SGP I tend to use PHD2 as I have a still camera rather than a video camera and I wanted to show you how I set it up and also some best practices about calibration and some ideas about getting the best out of the guider. So if I just hit PHD2 and if I connect to my equipment I have a ZWO uh, CMOS guide camera and I have a software connection to the SkyX that provides pulse guide rather than a, a hardware interface. So if I connect to it and if I look at the SkyX, here's the, um, the Zenith around here and this is my imaging horizon and I'm up here somewhere. So typically what I'll do is rather than calibrate at the declination of the target, I will calibrate at low declination and near the meridian. So typically I will go down here somewhere to zero declination and just before the meridian somewhere around here and slew to here. And the reason for this is that while some people prefer to calibrate at the target declination, every time you change the target you need to change the calibration. There's an alternative way of doing it which in PHD2 it calibrates once and once only at a low declination which provides a foundation calibration that can then be altered for any other declination. So for instance in PHD2 and I hit the brain there's in the guiding parameters there's one called deck compensation so it alters the right ascension guide rate depending on the scope declination and this only works for telescopes that are connected that are providing their their RA and DEC coordinates back to PHD2. If you are just using an ST4 cable, you can't use this method. So, what I typically do is choose a sensible shortish exposure of about a second and take a, a sample picture. And then in the latest versions of PHD2, there's an auto select star button. So I hit that and it will put a green square around the selected star, it's a reasonable shape. This is a centrally obstructed telescope so it, its star shapes aren't great at the margins. I'm using an off-axis guider. And then I'm going to hit shift and then the guide icon. And that will change the crosshairs to dotted yellow lines which says it's calibrating and it will go and calibrate the guider. Now it already knows the focal length because that's built into the the equipment profile and it reads the pixel size from the camera directly using an ASCOM command. So it now can work out what it's doing and then once it's done that it'll provide these little dotted yellow lines will now go back to green and um, showing that it's guiding. So I'm just going to let that carry on and then I'm going to come back to it when it's finished. Okay that didn't take too long so I've now got two solid green lines saying that it's guiding. And if I look under Tools menu and do Review Calibration Data here, it shows a series of dots following two lines that are at right angles to one another, and the dots are very close to the line, which shows I don't have much in the way of backlash on the, on the gears. And these two numbers here, the RA rate and the DEC rate, are very similar, which is another indicator that everything's working well when you calibrate at a low declination. If I wasn't at zero declination this number would be different to this one. So that looks good and I can now close that down and the guider trace is, is working along. So this is at the moment in arc seconds. If I hit settings I can either change it as pixels or arc seconds. I always choose arc seconds because it's a consistent measure and obviously the, the pixel size of the guide camera may be different to the pixel size on the imaging camera and so a pixel setting itself is, is not so useful for me. This yellow trace at the top here is showing me um, if you look under the settings you see that it says star mass so that's an indicator of how bright the star is. There's another one here called star signal to noise ratio so again if it starts getting very noisy or you get thin cloud come over these two traces at the top here will take a nosedive. Now it's just trundling along there 
And as it does so, it builds up a number of uh, values along here. So you get the root mean square error in pixels and in arc seconds for um, each axis and the total. So at the moment, my total RMS guiding error is about 0.5, which is a good result. But what I want to do is show you the difference between guiding at um, a short exposure, like a half second or one second, and a much longer exposure, like 10 seconds, and the effect on the trace, because it, it highlights a fundamental principle in the theory of guiding, which is that the actual error caused by the tracking errors is much smaller than the sample to sample error caused by seeing noise. So I'm going to just stop that for a second, I'll shut that for a sec, and zoom back out. And I'm going to move up to here somewhere. So I'm now going to clear this graph here, and I'm going to choose a half a second, and I'm going to take an exposure, and I'm going to choose a star. But before I hit the guide button, I'm going to disable the guider output because I want to see what the true effect of seeing and tracking is. So on here I'm going to disable the mount guide output and when I do that and hit guide a little warning comes up here. So it'll now trundle on and it'll go on for a couple of minutes and I'll stop it when it gets to here and we'll change the exposure time and see what the effect is. Okay. So we've taken 100 samples of half second intervals. So we're now going to change the time to 10 seconds and take a new image. And it will likely choose a different star because this one will probably be too, too bright and have clipped. So once that comes in in a few seconds, so you can see it's chosen a different guide star with a peak of 33,000, whereas this one is just too bright and has clipped. So hitting the guide button now, we'll continue to do a bunch of guider measurements rather than corrections and we'll look at the trace in a few minutes when it's reached the end of the graph here. Okay, what I wanted to show you here was the difference in the sample to sample variation with a long exposure time of 10 seconds compared to half a second. If you look at these values here from one moment to the next bearing in mind that this represents 100 times a half a second, so less than a minute, whereas this represents about 100 samples of 10 seconds, a considerably longer time. The actual variation from one sample to the next is much lower. Yes, the, the slope is higher, but that's simply because the, the timeline is in effect compressed here. And one of the tricks with guiding is to try and use the longest exposure time possible because what that does is it reduces the effect of seeing noise on measuring the centre of a star. Now, the other side of that coin is if you have a very bad tracking error, then you need to sample more quickly, otherwise you won't keep up with the real tracking error. This mount is quite good, the tracking errors are quite low and they don't change quickly. So there's no need to do rapid exposures and rapid corrections. All I'd be doing is chasing the, the, the seeing noise. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do now is quickly show you the difference between guiding at half a second and guiding at 10 seconds. So I'm just going to clear these graphs, hit the brain, enable the guider output, change my exposure time back to half a second, take a picture, and start guiding. Okay, just to show you the effect of a fast and furious guider, so I'm using default settings for aggression of 75% and it's doing a fairly reasonable job at trying to guide, but as you can see it's going up and down dramatically on each sample and it's got an RMS error of, of 0.44. I reckon I can improve on that by using a longer exposure time. So what I'm going to do now is hit stop here and I'm going to clear this. I'm going to move this up to 10 seconds, take a picture and then repeat. Okay, so now hit guide. So it's picked a new guide star, the one that is a better intensity for this purpose. One thing, by the way, to look for 
This star profile is quite useful if it has a flat top, and I mean a flat top sort of like this sort of width. That suggests that it's clipping, especially if you know it has a value of 65,000 or something like that. And if that is the case, you often get a warning down the bottom here that says it's clipped. There is a, a, a number of settings in here that tell you how to work out whether it's clipped or not, um, when I remember where it is. Uh, yes, here we are. Saturation via star profile. So you can either do it by default um, of the actual shape of the star, or you can just do it simply by um, a value here of a maximum ADU value. So this is doing it by the shape of the star with a flat top. Some cameras are not 16-bit and they do not produce 65,000. One of my guiders actually only produces 8-bit output, so just be careful about that. So anyway, we're now guiding with 10-second exposures with the same aggression rate. And you can see that the peak-to-peak -peak variation is much less. And to be honest, for... Um, a long exposure time because you're integrating this moving fluctuating star over a longer period of time you have a much better confidence that you can correct out that level of error so a 75 percent aggression rating is a sensible value to do with a long exposure time and typically if i was using a short exposure time of half a second or one second i would reduce the aggression down to maybe 50% or even potentially lower. So at the moment, the RMS error, after a similar period of time, is half that as, as we had before. So this is a far more successful guiding setup for this mount. And just um, so that you know I'm not cheating, if I just hit on the Sky X and double click on T-Point, I do not have my tracking adjustments enabled here. So this is the native worm drive of the mount. So if I click back onto PHD2 you can see that this is doing pretty well and the actual error is contained within half an arc second which on this particular camera is about one pixel on the actual imaging sensor. So I think this in, illustrates an important lesson about use the maximum exposure time possible to improve the stability of the, the mount, and to not thrash it around trying to correct things actually not a tracking error. There's nothing you can do about seeing. This is not using adaptive optics, and even adaptive optics have a, a minimum time of movement. You have to remember with a guiding system that once you've taken the exposure and do a correction, the error's already history. It's not present, it's, it's moved on. So occasionally, you will get a strange result. Now, it's quite windy at the moment, and I've just had a gust of wind, and it's just blown them out, and you can just see it's just done a, a freaky, freaky one there, but very quickly come back to a sensible value. So it's a, it's a balancing act. It's all about compromises. And in the second part of this video, I'll explain a couple of other ideas about alternative guiding algorithms and what to look for.